Welcome to Lambs to Lions. You're listening to the weekly podcast with Pastor Matt Funk. So good. Okay, so there's some confirmation here in the in the notes that you're gonna. Some of the guys are giving away my points already, but that's okay. So let's. Um, <laughs> The first verse that I that stood well that I wrote down was verse twenty five. He said to them, "How foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken!" Exclamation <laughs> mark. Right? I think sometimes we got to put emphasis where we need to put emphasis on things. Right? It's been spoken, and and Luke makes a powerful point. Just like when Jesus' disciples uh, impose their agenda and their view of the reality of. Jesus, he remains invisible and unknown to them. You notice that? We become slow to believe because we battle with our own unbelief. We fail to move in our God-given directions because at times we are too busy planning our own direction instead of God's. And I believe in my time, I've missed many miracles, I've missed many signs and wonders because I was too focused on my agenda and my obstacles, and even my own way. My agenda had a lot to do with my perceived reality. I've met a lot of people that have had their own view and reality on who Jesus is, and therefore, he is invisible to them, including his works. Would you agree with me? This was the case for the religious leaders at the time, they went to such great lengths of denial to go as far as to even crucifying Jesus because they were scared they would lose what power they had. And in their own insecurity, they didn't understand his methods and they had a hard time with how he delivered the message and who he claimed to be. So if Jesus' own disciples were slow to believe, where have I become slow to believe? That's, your, that's a question just for you. That's a reflection time. Fill that in. In verse 26, it said, did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? Did not the Messiah have to? You see, the first point is suffering is part of seeing. And what do I mean by that? You, we know that the word passion comes from the Latin word patur, which means to suffer. It's first used in the English language in 1175 AD, and the word passion was first used in the English to describe Christ's suffering for our sins on the cross. Hebrews 12, 2 says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Passion. We don't see passion in forms of suffering, do we? Well, the world doesn't. That's a passionate, that's a suffering person. Oh, that's a living sacrifice. Oh, there it is. That makes sense to me. If our true and proper worship, worship is to live our lives as a living sacrifice, that should be passion. That should be passion. Not just what's in it for me, but what I can do for thee, what I can do for him, what I can do for you, what I can do for his kingdom. You see, pain can cause us to run either two directions. It can cause us to run towards Christ or it can run, or run away. Towards the cross or away from the cross. But it was Christ's passion that led him through the pain so that his purpose and his promise could be fulfilled. Think about that. If you have the right passion in the right place, then you understand what it means to be a living sacrifice. If you have the right passion in the right place, it is the joy set before you that will allow you to endure the things that are in your path, that come upon you. Are you with me, Darren? You're smiling big back there, so something must be clicking. <laughs> so what joy is your strength so that you might fulfill the calling that God has placed on your life and see what he is doing already around you? 
verses 30 to 31. When he was at the table with them, he took the bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. Two is communion breaks the curtain. What do I mean by that? Sometimes we have veils. Sometimes we have curtains over our eyes that keep us from seeing the truth. We miss the miraculous because all we see is mirrors. A reflection of, a reflection of the world that we live in instead of the God that we serve. That's what communion does. It removes the curtain. In the act of communion, they could they could finally see Jesus. It wasn't until he broke the bread that they were able to believe. That is why it's important that we gather often and that we do communion often. That is why we need to always come back to the cross and back to the empty tomb. The evidence of what we can't see is proof that he is at work. Are you with me? If you believe that in your heart, you'll look at things differently. The evidence of what we can't see is proof that he's at work. The women come to the tomb and there's no Jesus because he's fulfilling his promise. He's at work. Just because you don't see him doesn't mean he's not working. Faith is the evidence of things hoped for yet not seen, Hebrews 11.1. 1. Maybe the reason we are missing miracles is because we are looking for what is always visible as opposed to what is invisible. If all we do is look for the natural, we'll miss the supernatural. Hope, gentlemen, is not blind. Hope is our anchor. Hebrews 6.19 says that we have hope as an anchor for the soul. Firm and secure, it enters into the inner sanctuary behind the curtain. After Jesus was crucified, the veil was torn. It was ripped in two so that you can go straight to the very throne of God because of what Jesus did for you. That's what happens when we break bread. We, we come back to keeping the main thing the main thing. We come back to the cross. We come back to his resurrection. Luke 24, 32, they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us? While he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? I don't know about you, but when I spend more time with Jesus and his word, my heart starts to burn with hope. It still works today. It gives me reason to rise. It gives me reason to run. It gives me reason uh, uh, for revelation. And it becomes my greatest resource. My own agenda starts to drift away as I lead towards him. That's what happens when I read the scriptures. I don't know about you, but that's what happens for me. Things start to shift. My focus starts to shift. Because I start focusing on him. I start hearing the word of God like you're hearing it today. It comes alive. It's active than any two edged, it's sharper than any two edged sword. It reveals things that are in our hearts. That's why it burns. This is when I begin to hear and understand the voice of God. I stop chasing stuff, and instead I, I start seeking the Spirit. When I open the Scripture, when I hear His Word. The more I read, the more I listen, the more I start to see and experience the miracles all around me. When I listen to God's Word, I feel liberated. I don't know about you, but I, when I read this, I feel liberated. Sometimes I feel like I'm an idiot. And then I read about these other guys, and I'm like, no, I'm not the only one. You know, like, yes, I'm missing stuff, but God's right there. And he will reveal himself to me. He will not forsake me. He will not forget about me. As foolish as I might be, he's still there. And if I'm willing to listen, he's always speaking. And he's always moving. He doesn't stop doing the miraculous just because I'm not focused on the main thing. You with me? He's always, it's whether or not I get to be a part of that.
When I listen to God's word, I feel I, I, that there's less of a need to focus on my own agenda. As I reflect, you know, uh, even on God's encounters in my own life, Every time that led me closer to him was in a time, in an act of sacrifice and worship. That where I had this like revelation. I can remember being at the gate, the gate victory church, downtown Lethbridge, and having this worship encounter for the first two weeks. I bawled like a baby because I could literally feel the tangible presence and love of God on me. Every time it hit me so hard. And it was in that point where I said, God, I realized I've been doing my thing. As much as I say, yeah, I'm a Christian, and I'm here, and I love Jesus, and I'm going to church, i got to be honest with you, I had my agenda. And now I'm ready to lay it down, whatever you want me to do, wherever you want me to go. And that's when ministry started in my life, truly started. It was then that he showed me miracles. It was then that he showed me and took me to new places, to new people. It's, it's then when there was already desires in my heart. Instead of chasing those desires, I chased him. And then the desires just started coming out. I was able to travel all around the world, right? My wife met my dream wife, my dream woman. Kids, five kids later. This church, this build, this is all part of an of, of a even bigger dream than I could ever hope, imagine, or dream of men. You guys, like, I'm telling you, it's when I, I, I sought him and, and, I, and, and I sacrificed, I just, I'm, I'm laying down my agenda, Lord, for you. That's, those were huge milestones in my life and still continue to be. And every day can be like that. You know, even to the point of having financial freedom, all these things have come after not seeking my own agenda. How am I going to make this work? How am I going to provide for my family? No, well, wait a minute. Who is the great I am? And who do I serve? He is my provider. And that's been one of my biggest revelations in, in times when I don't always have. I seek reason. I seek wisdom. I seek knowledge. I'm not stupid. But there comes to a point, too, where I just need to trust in him because he's dad. He's more than that. He's my Lord. And if he said it and all the scriptures point to him, and greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world, come on, who's the biggest limitation? Only me. Only I can be the biggest limitation to what God wants to do. But when I get in the scripture, when I get in the word, when I break bread with you men and do life together and come back to what this is all about, the cross, that's where the revelation hits me. And that goes to my third point is where scripture gives us sight. Scripture gives us sight. It is the truth that sets us free. Not the world's interpretation um, or, our or our agenda, but God's mission to fulfill his agenda. When we seek first the kingdom, then all things are added unto us according to his will. And remember, he knows the desires of your heart. Just don't let your own desires become your direction. You with me? Let him lead you and give you sight through his word, the scripture. So in conclusion, Luke makes this powerful point. Just like when Jesus' disciples imposed their agenda and their view of reality on Jesus, we remain invisible, or he remains, sorry, invisible and unknown to them just as he will to us. Does that make sense? How often do we as believers do the same thing? We try to impose our agenda on God's versus his. Our understanding versus his. Our ways instead of God's. It's only when we submit ourselves to the upside down kingdom of Jesus, hello, that he came, he came to serve, he came to save. He didn't come to condemn he came to set us free. And his broken body offered on the cross his self-giving love. It's only then that we see and know the real Jesus. Jesus' kingdom moves outward. So God's forgiveness can be announced to all the nations and that everyone is invited to receive and follow him. So the takeaway I have for you guys is this. When we impose our agenda and view of reality on Jesus, he remains invisible and unknown. I'll say that again if it's in your blanks. 
When we impose our agenda and view on the reality of Jesus, he remains invisible and unknown. Father God, we thank you for your word today. We thank you that it speaks truth and life to us, Father God. Lord, help us to see you. Help us to truly see who you are and how you move, even in the day-to-day, even through pain, even through suffering, even through loss. Lord, that we can see the light. We can see your promises being fulfilled. Death, where is your sting? Lord Jesus, we praise you and glorify you that you overcame sin and death. Father God, we praise you and glorify you that our brother Vince is in the house and that we know that his son is with you because of your promise and what you fulfilled on the cross through your resurrection. And we will celebrate you. We will honor you. And we will reach more men like Vince's son in the name of Jesus and set generations to come free by the men in this house in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for tuning in today and thank you for continuing to partner with us and for giving so generously to this ministry. If you would like to find out more about how you can partner with us, visit our website at www.wherepeoplematter.church and click the giving link. And don't forget to subscribe and share this with your friends. See you next time.